Well, it is good for me to be back here with you again. Uh, those of you who are regular members know I was here for the month of December during Advent, and I was here a few weeks back in one of the afternoon services. I enjoy being here with you and look forward to what God has to say to us this morning. I will be reading from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, but we're going to have that uh, projected because, as you can see underneath James 4 there, this is from the, the latest 2011 edition of the New International Version Bible. They're always working on updating that and things like that. And uh, the version you have in, in the pews, or most of you might have at home, uh, is, is great, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But in this latest edition, they, they took... The, the fifth verse in the edition, the, later, the earlier edition, was a footnote. And they flip-flopped that in this latest edition. Both work, okay, they're, they're both, uh, both good, but for some reason, unbeknownst to me, um, the, the editors and the translating committee took what had been a footnote and put that into the text. And that uh, text, as you will see, uh, leads me to the message that I feel God's calling me to preach this morning. Um, so, James 4 verses 1 through 12. Hear God's word as follows. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have. So you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And here's that fifth verse. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? These are the words of God. That, that fifth verse, I'll just get this out of the way here now, uh, as it reads in, as, as we just read it, right? Um, or do you think scripture says without reason that he, that God, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? The earlier edition took this, and actually there's two, two options in the footnote, but uh, the one that was in the earlier edition of the NIV says, or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to dwell in us envies intensely. Okay, after those first four verses to talk about a spirit in us envying jealously and intensely fits in. Um, but I think this verse, or do you think God is jealously longing for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us fits because then the next verse is, and he gives us more grace. And we'll, we'll see how that uh, unfolds in just a few moments. Dwight Moody once told a, par uh, an, a uh, fable of an eagle that was very envious and jealous of another eagle that could fly 
faster, could fly higher, and could fly better than he could. But one day that envious, jealous eagle saw a hunter down below with a bow and arrow, and he flew down to him, and in fables, animals uh, and birds can talk, so this eagle said to the hunter, I wish you would bring down that, that other eagle up there. And the man said that he would if he only had some more feathers for his arrow. So the jealous eagle pulled one out of his wing and gave it to the hunter, and the hunter pulled the string, and the arrow went up and missed the fly high-flying eagle by quite a distance. Well, then that first eagle pulled out another feather, and the same result, and then another feather, and another feather. And before you know it, that first eagle on the ground by the hunter had not enough feathers left to fly, and the hunter took advantage of that situation and killed that first helpless bird. And Dwight Moody made this application. If you are envious of others, the one you will hurt the most by your actions will be yourself. Getting hurt because we're attempting to hurt others or getting hurt ourselves because we're envious and jealous of what other people have is not a very Christ-like attitude, is it? Well, James is writing a very down-to-earth letter to Christians. And he's writing, you know, early or in the first century, and he's writing to Jewish Christians. And he begins his letter by saying, James, uh, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. He's writing with a, an Old Testament perspective, and, and that too will show itself uh, later in, in what we hear God say to us. But he's, he's writing to these believers in Jesus, and he's writing to them that they are acting out with an ugly sense of envy and jealousy. And acting out their envy was causing the, the believers to sin in a variety of ways. Listen again to some of the words in the first four verses that James uses to describe these followers of Jesus. What causes fights and quarrels? Don't they come from desires that battle within you? You covet. You want things that others have, but you don't ask God for them. So you don't get what you want, and then you end up with more fights and quarrels. Even if you were to ask God out of that envious jealousy of others, you don't get because you're asking with wrong motives. Only so that what you get you would use on your own pleasures. And then that harshest phrase in verse 4, you adulterous people. Now that doesn't mean that they were just acting out sexual adultery. That's an Old Testament image that God had used to talk to his people who were going after other gods. They were leaving God and going after pagan things. So you adulterous people, you're friends with the world, you're at enmity with God. You're an enemy of God. That is a ugly picture of believers in Jesus Christ. It certainly doesn't describe a group of people that I would want to be a part of. I don't think many of us would want to be a part of any group that is just quarreling and fighting and backbiting and backstabbing and coveting each other's things and, and forgetting God altogether. By their actions, they were damaging the very name of God within them. Imagine a, a non-believer, an outsider, looking at this group of God followers, Christ followers, and, and seeing this kind of action that must have been going on. I don't... I wouldn't blame anyone for saying, well, I don't want to be a part of that group, and they call themselves followers of Jesus. It was damaging the fellow people in their churches, in their fellowship groups, people for whom Jesus had died. They were fighting and quarreling and stealing and, and just always looking for something to 
what they thought would better themselves. And it had to be damaging their personal relationship with God. First of all, they weren't asking God for things to meet their needs. Uh, they weren't, they were just taking it upon themselves to try to get whatever they, they thought they needed and wanted. And even if they did get around to asking God for something, it was asking God for something that they wanted that their neighbor seemed to have and they didn't have yet and, and God wasn't providing answers to those kind of prayers. I appreciated your prayer, Roger, uh, earlier. You were praying out of a non-selfish attitude for other people. And that's one, that will be one uh, application of this message that we, we pray and we care for other people because we know there's a God who wants the best for God's people. And you even use those kinds of words. I'm not sure the situation is all that much better today within the church. James' warning and his commands are as relevant today as they were in the first century. Human jealousy, human envy is detrimental to our spiritual health so James writes these verses, he writes this book to expose our sinful jealousy, but also to tell us about how God graciously gives us more grace because God jealously longs for what is good in us and for us. And then James writes even some challenges, some commands to us to, to practice godly jealousy. Well, we've already looked at that first point. For those of you who like to keep track, the first point of this message would be we are a jealous, envious people because we are human beings. And it's, it's an ugly situation. We're done with that. So let's move on then to the fact that God is a jealous God. Listen again to that fifth verse. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he, that God, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. God is a jealous God. Now if we only think about human jealousy, we say, well, how could a good God be jealous? But there is a godly jealousy. God longs for, he's jealous for, the good. In the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, we read, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And then he goes on to say that out of his jealousy, he will punish those who sin, even the children of the parents to the third and fourth generation. He's jealous for himself and he will not put up with those who practice idolatry. And he goes on to say that those who obey him, he will show love to a thousand generations of those. So God's jealousy shows itself in anger against those who disobey him and who profane his name by worshiping idols. And his jealousy is seen by graciousness, more grace, grace and favor to the humble, James writes, for those who obey. In Exodus 34, that same Old Testament book that the Ten Commandments are in, in Exodus 34 verse 14, we read this, then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people I will do wonders never before done in any nation in the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. Uh, I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So not only 
is the fact that God is a jealous God something we can say well that's an adjective of God but God says that his name is jealous that's how dear this description of God is to him his name is jealous and the mention of God's name in the Bible refers to to his being and his very character so God is letting us know that his very character is that of being a God who is jealous of himself and for his people with great fervor and with great zeal God will defend his name he will defend his being he will defend his very character in the world so God is jealous for his name and he will do whatever it takes to have his name exalted and kept singular as far as other gods in the world may go and you'll you'll find as you read through scripture that this idea of God's jealousy shows itself most often with idolatry when when people are worshiping other gods or other things wanting coveting other things fighting and quarreling with each other for things trying to get stuff that may be wants instead of needs God's jealousy flares up and he does not put up with it and the more I read scripture the more often I see this um, and it's 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 again the very character of God so it it shows itself in scripture in Psalm 79 um, the psalmist begins oh God the nations you have the nations have invaded your inheritance they have defiled your holy temple they have reduced Jerusalem to rubble we are objects of contempt to our neighbors of scorn and derision to those around us how long Lord will you be angry forever how long will your jealousy burn like fire see the the, the psalmist was aware that God's people who had gone after other gods and trusted in other nations were being punished or shall we say disciplined by God and he's crying out how long will this jealousy of yours burn I mean it's like a fire to us as a, as a people they needed to realize that if they were worshiping God alone and not going after God's not being adulterous people with things other than God God's love would show to them and to thousands of generations so God is very jealous for his name for his character for his being and he's also jealous for his people the people of his own choosing for whom Jesus died and he shows that even in spite of the ugly character of his adulterous bride God gives more grace verse 6 but he gives us more grace that is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble or but shows grace to the humble God is our husband he established a covenant with his people and that covenant is described throughout scripture Old Testament and New Testament as as a marriage covenant we are the bride of Christ God is our husband and within that covenant our husband jealously guards our relationship if any of us could ima um, imagine a marriage a, the perfect marriage the husband would jealously guard his wife and if anything came along that would risk the purity of their marriage the the uh, the wholesomeness of their marriage the the service of their marriage that husband would would go to any extreme to get rid of that destroyer of the marriage and he would be jealous in a godly sense for his marriage and in a sense I guess for for his name the name of him and he and his wife together that's that's a picture to take of God's jealousy 
for us. So he is zealously jealous for us, his people. And he will do that for all eternity. He will not put up with anything that risks the covenant that he has with us. Secondly, he, he'll forgive the sins of his people through Jesus Christ. God's name is jealous and he will see to it, he will go to any extreme, any measure to keep his bride with him. That's why that language, you adulterous people, is so, such a harsh description. You've broken the marriage covenant with God. But God, through Jesus, restores us and forgives us and he restores us for sins of the past, the present, and the future. The forgiveness that we have, friends, in Jesus Christ is an eternal forgiveness. God has, is so jealous for us that he provided the forgiveness for eternity. That's amazing grace. And he will provide for all the needs of his people. Maybe not all of our wants, and a lot of the things we want end up being the things that we fight and quarrel over, but God promises to, for, to meet all of our needs. He, he's so jealous for us, he's not going to let us miss out on anything that we need, just like a, a perfectly jealous husband in the perfect marriage would not allow his, his bride to be in need of anything. He would provide that. And he shows his jealousy for his people also by, by equipping us to be able to stand up against the temptation, temptations of the devil. Today is, as well as Memorial Day, it's Pentecost Sunday. And we are re, we're celebrating as the Christian church the fact that God sent his spirit to his church to, to equip us with the gifts of his Holy Spirit to do all things in his name. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when there's a temptation that comes our way, God will, will give us what we need to stand up against it and to provide a way out for it. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have the gifts of God living within us, equipping us to be his bride in this world. Amazing. And we receive those gifts with humility. And, and we stand with those gifts and say, Wow, God has given to me his very presence by his spirit to live in this world, to serve in this world, to bring honor to his name. So God is jealous for his name and he equips us to be his bride in the world. And thirdly, God is jealous for the praise and worship that's due him. God desires that his bride acknowledge him as her faithful provider and lover. And in so doing, to give him alone the honor due his name. We, we did that earlier in the service. We're, we're here to worship God. And we did that through song. We honored God through our offerings. We honored God, God by praying to him. We were saying, God, you are the one who makes our existence possible. So we, we honor you, we bow down to you, we give you glory, we glorify your name and your name alone. We, we try to be obedient to you by, by returning some of the resources you've given to us, whether it be financial or other spiritual gifts, abilities, talents. We, we give them back to you, Lord our God, and we, we honor you in our prayers by saying, hey, we can't fix things here. We need you to fix things, God. So we offer up the prayers for, for the saints that were offered by Raj earlier to say, God, please bring healing. Please bring comfort. Please bring your presence into situations that, that uh, can only be solved by you. God is jealous for us to do that. And he wants us to do that to him and to him alone. That's God. But God made us in his image. 
So I think God wants us to be as jealous for the things that he's jealous for as he is. We need to be zealous in being jealous for the name of God and for the honor of God. So we need to be zealously jealous for God's name. J.C. Ryle was a pastor and author who lived in the 1800s and he, he wrote this, a zealous man only sees one thing. He cares for one thing. He lives for one thing. He is swallowed up in one thing and that one thing is to please God. A person who is zealous for God will be jealous for God and for God alone. No idols, no other gods, no other things that might take the place of focusing on God and on God alone. God calls us to be zealous for his name. Now that will mean something different, I think, for each and every one of us. I did preach this sermon last Sunday night in my, in my own church, and afterwards a gentleman came up to me and says, what does it mean to be zealous for God? You know, and I, oh, yeah, I mean, that, okay, that's easy for me to say, but I think that's going to be different for each one of us. How is our life going to show that we are zealous for God? Right? How do we show that we are zealous for other things? We clean our boat, we clean our house, we clean our clothes, uh, we work hard at, at work, we, uh, we train children, right, to be able to serve in the world, to, to learn things. I mean, we're, we're, we're zealous for lots of the things that God has given to us. So I, I guess personal, a personal challenge is for you to say, well, how am I zealous for the things of the world? And then how can I show God that I'm as zealous for him by doing the same kinds of things? Uh, if I'm zealous for keeping my, my house neat and in order, will I then use my clean and neat house for God's glory by maybe inviting some people over? That could be. Am I zealous for making a good meal uh, with all the right spices and, and present it? Well, that's, that's good. Uh, I love to eat. Um, you know, so if, if you love to serve good meals, I, you know, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you my, my phone number. You could invite me over to have, have that meal. See, so it's going to be different. I, I can't say for each, in a general way, what does it mean to be zealous for God, but how, how do you act towards the things that, that you love? And, and, and turn, that, turn that same level of intensity, of zealousness, for God. Um, in verses 7 through 11, well, we could start a convenience store chain with a name like that, couldn't we? Verses 7 through 11, God gives us commandments. That's why, that's one of the reasons why I like to have verse 5 say what it says, because God is zealous for us and for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us, and he, and he gives us commandments. He, in fact, he gives us ten commandments. James writes them out for us here. They're all commands in actually verses 7 through 10 about how we can be zealous for God. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these 10, but first of all, submit yourselves then to God. Okay, so be zealous to saying, God, here I am. I submit myself to you. I am your servant. Uh, I am your, your mouthpiece. I am here for you to do what you want to do. And you are God. Secondly, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Again, uh, we have these envious and selfish, selfish ambitions um, that are in the first four verses. And those are of the devil. Really, they're not of God. So we need to resist that kind of activity saying, Wow, I, I covet so-and-so's meal preparation abilities or, or house or boat, or I covet someone else's financial records. Uh, you know, we have to say, hey, that, I mean, we can, we can thank God for those things that other people have, but we shouldn't be coveting so that we're not going to be quarreling and fighting about them, right? And, and even going to the point right, of, of killing 
James writes there. We need to resist the devil with, with zeal. We need to dig in our heels and we need to turn the other way when we see something that comes along that we say, that's not of God, that's of the devil. Thirdly, he writes in verse 8, come near to God. And here's another Old Testament allusion where the people of Israel would have to come near to God. God's presence was in that tabernacle and, and in that temple at Jerusalem. And the people came from all over the country to come near to God to worship him. Listen, in, in 2 Chronicles 15, Old Testament passage, uh, for a long time Israel was without the true God. Without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. And he was found by them. Old Testament illustration of the people of God realizing that they had turned their back on God and that they needed to come near to God again. And when they came near to God, God was there for them. God was found by them. Draw near to God. Again, whatever that might mean for you. There's, there's not a simple one, one uh, example that fits all here. What does it mean for you to draw near to God? How close are you to God? How can you draw closer? Come near to God. And then he says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Two of them, wash your wash and purify. Again, an Old Testament allusion to the people of Israel who were... <clears throat> called upon to wash in that living water. And I'm so uh, thankful you have this bubbling fountain here of, of living water. And I understand that when that first came here, uh, some of you came forward and, and took some of that water and washed, washed, I don't know if your head, put some on your head. But, but the Old Testament people of, of God had what was called a mikvah. And I have a picture of one here that was at... Uh, Qumran. <clears throat> Qumran was where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, right? So right by the Dead Sea. But all over Israel you find these mikvahs. M-I-K. Oh, it's right there. Um, but people would, would walk down those steps. Okay, you can see the little sidewalk there on the top right hand corner of that picture. So you get an idea of how big this thing is. This was, people would walk down these steps into, into this living water and they would wash spiritually wash, I mean with, with water, wash their hands, they would put some on their head, they would wash their heart, and they would wash their feet. And that was in obedience to God's command, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus added, and, and, and with your mind as well. So the people would wash, and, and they would take that water and wash their hands. Wash their, their thoughts, the, the, their activities, their soul, and, and their, their paths where they would go. And, and that was in obedience. So, so now James writes, wash your hands. Cleanse yourself. Be with God and God alone. Purify your hearts. And then in verse 9, there's three, of, three commands there. They're all in one phrase. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Again, I think that's an Old Testament allusion to just being sorrowful and repentant for your sins. Grieve for your sins. It's one thing to say, oh, sorry God, sinned, uh, forgive me. It's another thing to grieve over that because you're, you're hurting the name of your spiritual husband, your covenant partner. Do you hate sin so much that you'd grieve over it, that you'd mourn over it, that you'd wail over it? Old Testament people would tear their clothes and they'd put ashes on their heads and they'd sit by the side of the road if they had sinned to let people know how, how much their sin hurt them. Humble yourselves before God. Well, excuse me. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's a command. Now that doesn't mean we have to be gloomy people all the time. But it means, I, I think it means we have to take our relationship with God seriously that it's not just a joke. It's not just something we say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. Good, good times for all. Uh, it's to say, wow, this is serious stuff that I am committed to God and to God alone. 
And then the tenth command is, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We're married to the King of Kings and the Creator God, and we need to humble ourselves before him. We're also to be, as followers of God, zealous in our jealousy for the bride of Christ. It's one thing to honor God's name, and those Ten Commandments get us in a right relationship with God. But we also need to be zealously jealous for each other, because I'm not just the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. So we, we're in this together. We do this, to, we don't let anybody go off by themselves. We don't let anybody grieve by themselves or be happy by themselves. We need to be jealous for each other that, that well, I need, to, I need to be jealous f for you that you're, you're living the kind of life that honors God. So that means if I see you going down the wrong path, I need, I have a responsibility to you and you to me. We need to be jealous for the fact that we won't let anyone do anything that dishonors the very name of God. Be jealous for each other as, as followers of Christ. Can you, uh, again, the first four verses, right? Fights and quarrels, uh, desires, uh, coveting, killing, adultery, adulterous people, wrong motives. Could that have been read about a group of people who were going to each other and saying, hey, you know, that, that, that fighting, uh, I apologize for fighting and, and wanting what you have, and, and I think you need to do that for, for him, him or her. And if, if the whole body were going to each other in the name of Jesus in love and saying, I want only what's best for you, you know, then, then this, these first four verses would be mute. They'd, they'd be gone. When, when Raj prayed for other people, mentioned this earlier, he, he prayed out of jealousy for those people that they would experience God's blessing. So when we pray, we, we need to pray with jealousy, when we pray for other people at least, interceding, we pray for other, uh, we, we pray with a, a sense of jealousy and, and a zealousness to our prayers that God would show his jealousy in love to them. Today is Memorial Day. And we've already done some honoring of that, and I'm, I, I appreciate that. This is not a typical, this wouldn't be a typical Memorial Day passage of Scripture, if there are any of those, because Memorial Day to America is, is different than what God's Word is all about. But those who served and were willing to give their lives for our country were saying, in a sense, I am jealous for the freedoms that we as citizens of this country have and I will be willing to risk my life, to put my life on the line so that those freedoms that we have in this country would be continued. See, so in, in a sense, those who serve in the military serve out of jealousy for what's good, for, for freedom and for respect of citizenship in, in the United States of America. If people would sign up in the military only to show how strong they are or that they could hurt people with a weapon, and we see that every once in a great while, right, that people go off the deep end really with that. But, uh, that that's, that's not serving out of jealousy, out of concern for anyone else. But I thank God that there were people willing and that there are people willing to serve in the military <clears throat> of our country to preserve, to be jealous for the freedoms that we have. And we, need, we do need to thank those people and we need to express our gratitude to them and keep them in our thoughts and prayers. They're zealous for the, with jealousy for our country. God calls us to be as zealous and jealous for his church. And then finally, we are to be zealous, to be jealous in our praise and worship of God. 
Do we put our all into our worship? Did you wake up this morning and say, wow, I have the chance to meet with other Christians worshiping the holy God, the creator God, the, the loving God, the savior God. And, and I, I'll give up anything to be there in worship. I don't always think that way. I, I think it more when I'm leading worship. I, um, but when I am just attending worship, it's, it's easy just to say, oh, it's Sunday morning uh, and I go to church on Sunday, which is a good habit to be in. But am I zealous for the jealous, uh, zealous? Am I zealous to be jealous for worship? Am I putting my all into my worship? Am I seeking the glory and honor of God's name and God's name alone? Or am I just singing songs? Or am I just putting some money in a collection plate? Do I just teach a class? Or do I do that out of jealousy for the very character of God? That's where we should be. Because God knows where our heart is at. He knows if we're just worshiping out of superstition and form. And if that's all our worship is, that's pretty close to idolatry, that we're just worshiping something, not the living God. God calls us to worship him because, and because he is a jealous God, when our worship is, is pure and in spirit, then God has promised to meet us in worship and to jealously meet all of our needs. He's given us the spirit and he's given us his name to live with. Will you join me in whichever way this looks, again, because there's not a one size fits all, but will you join me in being zealous to be jealous for God as God is zealously jealous for us. It's a big job. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. But God equips us to do it. Let's pray. Father God, husband God, your word has told us that you are jealous for yourself and that you are jealous for us. And your word has exposed our prideful, sinful, selfish jealousy that too often shows its ugly head. But yet your word has, has met us in our need and tells us that you provide grace, more grace. Grace and favor and love to the humble, to those who admit that we need you. So this morning, we're crying out, saying... We need you. We're crying out that we love you. We're crying out that we want to worship you. And that your name is the name above all names. Meet us in our need. Equip us for our service. In Jesus we pray. Amen.